All right, hello again, econ students. We're back with another uh, section of notes here. This is the last little section. Um, so what we've done so far, we've talked about four things that, again, everyone would agree, yes, it's good for the government to get involved in the economy in these ways. And those four things were creating law and order, and we talked about that uh, in quite detail. We talked about setting standards, and that was pretty simple. We talked about providing public goods, because the free market does not do a good job of providing public goods. And then with the worksheet yesterday, we talked about externalities okay, and how the free market does not do a good job in dealing with externalities. So those four things, again, even a very conservative person would say, yes, the government can help the economy or aid the economy in these ways. Now, again, I'm not saying that should be the extent of it. I'm not saying the government shouldn't do anything else. Okay, But what I want to give you in this point here is, okay, if we're going to allow the government to provide other things or do other things in the economy, these are certain... Um, drawbacks that we need to be aware of, things that could go wrong, and we just have to know and weigh that as part of the costs and benefits of should the government do it. So the first thing to understand is that political goals and economic goals oftentimes are very different. Okay, in other words, what is politically popular isn't always right economically, or what is economically appropriate isn't always popular politically. Okay, so uh, politicians, and again, I, I want to make this clear, I am not saying politicians are bad people. Please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say here. I'm not saying they're bad people, but they're responding to incentives in the same way we are. Okay, so in order to get elected, sometimes you need to say what's popular, and that's not always the best economic policy. But in their defense, again, if you want to do good things, you can't do any good thing unless you're elected in the first place. And so sometimes they do things for the sake of getting votes, um, and that's not always the best case scenario for our economy. It's just what it is. Again, I'm not saying they're bad people and I'm not faulting them. We would do the same things if we were in their position. Honestly, we would respond to incentives the same way they do. We just have to understand that that's a factor, okay? That, that they might do things that are politically popular that aren't necessarily economically appropriate. Uh, the second one is the difference between political time and economic time. Similar here, uh, we're talking about how uh, politics, the, the payoff politically can tend to be immediate. If the government passes a policy or a program or it could be a stimulus or it could be a whatever, uh, they could see an immediate boost in their approval ratings, in the numbers, in the polls or whatever else. It could take years for the actual effects of that policy or program to start infiltrating through the economy. And the effects might be good or bad, but the, the, uh, the, the policy has already been passed and the election has already been won by that time. Okay, so let me give you a quick uh, example of how this could play out. And, and again, this is a, a fake example, but this has played out many times in history, similar things. So let's say that in Lexington, we have a public transportation system called Lextran, okay? Operates the buses and, and things like that, right? So let's say that our Lextran buses are starting to get a little bit older, starting to fall into disrepair, they need to be uh, fixed up more often, and eventually the Lextran is gonna have to start getting money to replace the entire fleet because they're simply aging. Well, where does Lextran get the money to fix and repair the buses that are breaking down and ultimately to replace the entire fleet? Probably by raising bus fares. Now, the problem is we don't like it when bus fares go up. If you ride the bus and that's how you depend on getting to work or getting to whatever, um, you're not gonna like that very much. So let's say there's an outcry, there's, there's backlash over the fact that Lextran has been raising rates. Well, our mayor, because our mayor is benevolent and he cares about us, uh, might say, you know what? Nobody likes high bus fares. So I hereby decree we're gonna put a price ceiling on bus fares, okay? So we're gonna lower prices and put a cap on how much the bus company, how much Lextran can charge for bus fares. Now, immediately there's gonna be a payoff, right? We had a problem, bus fares going up, the mayor solved the problem. Okay, and so, uh, you know, again, he's gonna get a boost in his popularity or in the polls or in his approval rating and everything else. And so what will happen is this, you know, again, think about it this way. The moment he signs that, that uh, policy, are all the buses in Lexington going to immediately uh, break down or explode or whatever? Else? Of course not. It's gonna be okay for a while. Now, four or five years later, when we've elected our mayor because he's so good to a higher office, maybe we've elected him to Frankfurt, or maybe we've uh, elected him to the U.S. Senate because we think to ourselves, man, this guy is too good of a secret to keep to ourselves here in Lexington. So we need to elect him and send him to the U.S. Senate to make decisions for the entire nation. Well, let's say we're now three, four, five years later, and now we have a real problem on our hands. 
buses are, are legitimately starting to break down and need to be replaced, but now Lextran does not have the money to do it, right? And so we're gonna look at the current mayor, the guy that's in office now and say, what a loser this guy is. Remember our last mayor? We had a problem and he solved it. I'm so glad he's in, in uh, DC making decisions for the entire nation. Now this loser we've got now, he couldn't make a decision. Well, what, what happened is the political time was on a very different time frame than the economic time. Political time tends to be immediate. Economic time tends to lag. Again, it can be years before the effects of a policy can show up and we can determine if that was good or bad. Um, and yet, uh, politicians have already gotten reelected or elected to higher office and this kind of stuff happens all the time. So again, just something we need to be aware of, it is what it is. Lastly, uh, one of the problems the government has, and I've already talked about this a little bit before, is dealing with what we call incremental adjustments. So again, let's go back to our beloved supply and demand graph here. Okay, and we know about equilibrium, right? Equilibrium, of course, is the point where supply and demand meet. And again, when you say supply, you could really be talking about marginal costs, okay? The marginal cost of doing uh, an activity or producing something. And of course, demand is the same thing as the benefit, technically marginal benefit, okay? Uh, marginal to be specific, okay? The additional benefits, okay? Now, we know how we operate in life. We, if we're making a decision, we like to stop right here, right, at equilibrium, because at this point, if you were to go further, the cost exceeds the benefit. And we tend to do a really good job of making these decisions for ourselves because we know our costs and benefits and we can weigh those and we can make the appropriate decision. Now, the government, and again, I'm not faulting the government. It's not that they're made up of bad people who wanna harm us or anything else. It's just really difficult for them sometimes to figure out exactly where that point is. And if they do, it's gonna be different for different people, okay? The problem you run into is politicians love sometimes to uh, extol the benefits of a particular program and kind of ignore or not tell you about the costs, okay? Now, just because there's a benefit doesn't mean we should do it. Now, if you remember at the beginning of the unit, I give you those questions that you fill out and I collect and all that. One of the questions was, is a policy worth implementing even if it only saves one life? Okay, so that was the question. Is a policy worth implementing even if it only saves one life? Now I looked through those questions, there are a lot of people who answered yes. You said yes, it would be worth it, life is worth it, and therefore we should implement it, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. The number one cause of death, and has been for decades, uh, of infants in this country uh, is car accidents. Okay, more than any other reason, uh, more infants die uh, because of car accident than any other cause in this nation. Now, we could avoid a lot of car accidents and a lot of fatal car accidents, especially if we lowered the speed limit to five miles an hour. Okay, so think about that. If we lower it to five miles an hour, um, if there was a car accident, it almost certainly would not be fatal. Now, the question is this. How many of you, ask yourselves, how many of you uh, would like to lower the, be in favor of lowering the speed limit to five miles an hour so that we could save lives in car accidents? Now, I'm gonna guess most of you are saying to yourself, no. Okay, now, I just want to be sure, if that's the case, if you said to yourself, no, that's not worth it, I want you to make sure you understand your decision. You're saying that you're okay with letting people die so that you can get to where you need to go a little bit faster. Okay, is that the case? Because I, I need to know this because uh, if my life is in your hands one day, I want to know who I'm dealing with. Now, here's the thing, I probably made you feel terrible, terrible about yourself, but you're weighing the costs and benefits. Now, here's the reality. It's not just a matter of, well, I, I, it's an inconvenience for me. Think of how much our economy would slow down if we can only go five miles an hour. Think of how that would affect uh, carpooling to work or uh, uh, commuting or uh, you know, deliveries and, and things like that um, all across the nation, interstate uh, trade and everything else, right? That would very negatively affect the economy. And so we, might, we would certainly save some lives but it would also be at the expense of other lives because as economies grow, lives tend to be saved, all right? For example, uh, if an earthquake, a major earthquake were to hit a city like San Francisco, fewer people would die than if a major earthquake hits a big city in a poor nation. And the reason is San Francisco has the money to first of all build buildings that can withstand earthquakes and aftershocks. It's very expensive to build buildings that way, but they can do that. Uh, they have uh, trained medical personnel and first responders and equipment and hospitals and things like that. 
Big cities and poor nations, they tend to not have as many of those things. And so if a big earthquake hits, they're not gonna be able to save as many people. And so bottom line is, um, if your answer to that question, is it worth, uh, is a policy worth implementing if it saves only one life? If your answer was, it depends on the cost, now you're thinking economically. We can't just say, it, it, we might save one life at the cost of five lives for some other reason. Okay, so we can't just set it up. But again, a lot of times it's easy for the government to say, look, it saved a life, therefore it's worth it. We don't have the luxury of making that decision. We have to ask the question, what were the costs involved? That was the benefit, yes, but what were the costs involved? And again, the government tends to struggle with that, not because they're bad people, it's just not, it's very difficult to measure that and figure out, okay, where's this point, as opposed to going too far, simply because there's still a positive benefit. If the costs outweigh the benefits, then it's not necessarily worth it, okay? And so that's what we gotta look at. So again, I'm not saying the government shouldn't do any more than those four things I mentioned previously. I'm saying if we are gonna have them do more, these are things we need to be aware of because there's no free lunch out there, as economists like to say. There's always a cost and benefit to everything, so we can let the government provide education, healthcare, retirement, all these things, that's fine. We have to understand these might be some of the drawbacks, and maybe it's still worth it. Maybe the positives, maybe the benefits that come out of these programs are worth it, but we, have to, we as economists have to ask the question, and that's the point that we're doing here. We're asking the question, okay, what are the costs and what are the benefits, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. As always, if it doesn't or something you need more uh, clarification for, uh, shoot me an email or a text. I'd be glad to help you out. Otherwise, hopefully I've seen you sooner than later. Take care.